the first stanza is vaishnav janato tene kahiye je peed parai jane re par dukhe upkar kare to ye man abhiman na aane re sakhal lok mam sahune vande nindana kare keni re the vaishnavs are those who feel the pain of others help those who are in misery but are never conceited they respect the whole world never speak ill of anyone narsi was thrown out of his community the nagars which is also my community because he would sit down and eat with anyone dalits muslims his vaishnavism had room for all humanity it was all about humanity narsi was the true gujarati his disciple Mohandas Gandhi was also a true Gujarati but the tradition of Narsi is being perverted today because there's another image of Gujarat and Gujaratis that the world sees today this is the Gujarat of Narendra Modi not Narsi Mehta and i belong to the Gujarat of Narsi not Naren the 2002 massacres in Ahmedabad in which children saw their parents set on fire and their mothers raped made me ashamed to be gujarati the caa and the nrc with its eventual goal of a nationwide system of gulags for muslims now make me again ashamed to be gujarati because they were propagated by a pair of gujaratis there's another gujarati gautam adani who's opening the largest coal mine in australia an existential threat to the planet there are gujarati industrialists that say nothing as all the nation's institutions are corrupted and corroded by other gujaratis I want to tell the world please don't judge all Gujaratis by their actions. These people do not represent me or millions of other Gujaratis. We are kinder than them, we are more open than them, we are better than them. But it's true that my homeland has in recent times a bloody history. I grew up going to Ahmedabad on my holidays to visit my relatives. My grandfather's house in Maninagar was right next to a Muslim locality. In peaceful times the Muslims shopped in the Hindu owned markets. the hindus went to muslim tailors during the tufan the border suddenly became visible tangible you were not to step across this line there were always the boys standing guard armed with hockey sticks knives kerosene the same people who would willingly throw kerosene on a man and burn him alive would then go home and eat a strictly vegetarian lunch the gujaratis who lead the country today are vegetarian because they don't want to hurt animals I'm vegetarian too but so was Hitler My vegetarianism is a very personal decision it does not allow me to lynch a man just because he doesn't follow my religion and eats beef My Gujarati thali has room My Gujarati thali has room for all kinds of foods all kinds of flavors some sweet some salty some spicy The BJP thali has only two flavors sour and bitter Where is the famous Gujarati sweetness the gadpan and just to be clear I'm no fan of the Congress party either I don't think India should be anyone's family run business another kind of Tata Birla dynasty <laughs> The Gujaratis who lead the country now want to turn India into a national Ahmedabad all are welcome in their India they say except Muslims and also Christians once they're done with the Muslims and gays once they're done with the Christians and women once they're done with the gays There are people in that party who admire not Gandhi ji but Godse. They openly praise the murderer of the man who defined the best of Gujarat. Vaishnav janato kone kahiye. Who is the true Vaishnav? What kind of Gujarati are these? These are certainly not the Gujaratis of Narsi. They are not Vaishnav jan because they do not feel the pain of others. They actively cause pain to others as we have seen in the messaging they are giving to Muslims that they do not belong in India. They do not respect the whole world. They believe everything was invented in India first and India is superior to all others. They constantly speak ill of others, Pakistanis, journalists, writers, NGOs, and they are full of conceit about their 56-inch chests. A Vaishnav is not filled with pride, garva or asmita as the Hindutvadis define it. Man abhimana na aane re as Narsi thinks. For the true Vaishnav, there is only humility, acceptance, welcome, empathy with those who are suffering. Any wanderer who comes to his house will be given water, shade, rest. There was an earlier Gujarat which had to rely on an openness 
to other cultures, religion, if nothing else than for purely mercantile reasons. In order to be a good businessman, in order to have the widest possible market, you have to trade with many people who may be very different from you. You have to put aside your hatred and you have to be pragmatic. The Gujaratis now in charge of the country's business have failed in the first duty of a Gujarati businessman to make a profit. They are running India as a loss-making unit. The unemployment rate is the highest in 45 years. Consumer prices are 7.3% higher than last year. Onions cost 328% more than they did. India now has the slowest growth of all the emerging economies at 4.8% and falling. According to The Economist, it would have been 3.1% if the government hadn't gone on a spending spree to boost numbers. For decades, the Indian growth rate was so steady at 3.5% that it used to be known as the Hindu rate of growth. Under Modi, we're now experiencing an even lower rate, the Hindutva rate of growth. <laughs> he promised to build millions of toilets, but it's the economy that he's dressed, dragged into the toilet. <laughs> and so, to divert attention from its failures, the government is encouraging everyone to focus on hating Pakistan, hating Muslims, keeping an imaginary Bangladeshi hoard out. It's the politics of mass diversion. Trump does it with Mexicans, the Brexiteers do it with Eastern Europeans, Modi and Shah do it with Bangladeshis. Any real Gujarati would be concerned about the incalculable harm these nativist Islamophobic policies are having on the country's international image and its business prospects. Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO, recently had the guts to take on the CAA directly. Quote, I think what is happening is sad, it's just bad, he said. I would love to see a Bangladeshi immigrant who comes to India and creates the next unicorn in India or becomes the next CEO of Infosys. So far, few other industrialists, except Rahul Bajaj, and certainly none of our Gujarati mill maliks, have had the guts to say openly what many think privately. But many countries and companies like to trade with India because we are better than, say, China. We are an open society. We are not Pakistan. We don't have a state religion. We are not a Hindu country. But if that image changes, if you yank someone's OCI card because of what he writes, or if you use the tax authorities to browbeat media houses into submission, or if you use the machinery of the state to beat up students in their dorms, then we have become a Kela Republic, just like all the other banana republics. Then our companies will be the targets of boycotts in the West and will stay away from India. Already. There are official bodies like the US Commission on Religious Freedom that are recommending sanctions on Indian ministers. Young South Asians on university campuses abroad are outraged by what India is doing in Kashmir, depriving 12 million Indian citizens of access to the internet, which is a matter of life and death these days for months on end. There's talk of boycotts against India, just like the BDS movement against Israel. Last week, The Economist's cover featured the slogan, Intolerant India. The New York Times, The New Yorker, and Time Magazine have all featured long cover stories about what we're going through, the greatest crisis in our democracy since the founding of the Republic. When Amazon's Jeff Bezos visited India recently, bringing with him a billion dollars of investment, he was given the cold shoulder by the government because he owns the Washington Post, which has also run caustic editorials about India. Whether we like it or not, the world now thinks of India in the same league as other corrupt and re repressive regimes such as Brazil, whose leader was the chief guest at the Republic Day parade yesterday, and Turkey. We have lost our good name. This is going to cost us money. Gujaratis are, above all, a pragmatic people. It is pragmatic to make accommodation with everyone, even your enemies, especially your enemies. Today, India is the world's second largest Muslim country, right behind Indonesia. By 2060, India will be the biggest mis Muslim country on earth. The Muslim population will go from 15 to 20 percent of the country, and nothing short of an outright genocide is going to change that. So far, Indian Muslims have not been radicalized. No Indian Muslim joined ISIS, and the women of Shaheen Bagh waved the tricolor, even as the protest government policy. These are people who voted with their feet to stay in the country after partition. But if Indian Muslims are constantly otherized, if they're told over and over again, you don't belong here, you are not truly Indian, 
then some segment of them is sure to become radicalized. Even if it's 1% of Indian Muslims, that's still 4 million people. And then what? We could have the mother of all civil wars, something that will make partition look like a fight in the schoolyard. We can't afford not to work together or be diverted by fighting each other because the next few decades are going to be challenging, even apocalyptic. Take just one issue, water. By 2030, 40% of Indians will have no drinking water. And demand for water will be twice the available supply. India will have run out of groundwater. I saw this every time I went to Gujarat as a child. My grand aunt could recite the names of the five rivers that flowed through her part of Gujarat. All of them are dry now, or mere trickles in the monsoon. Duryu Desh, they call it, the dust country. All of India is going to be a Duryu Desh. Last June was the hottest year in India's history, as you well know. Thousands of people died in heat waves. If global emissions continue at the current rate, temperatures will raise four and a half degrees by the end of the century, and large parts of northern India and Bangladesh will be quite, lit quite literally unsurvivable. Human beings will roast to death if they step outside. We have to fight all these problems together, Hindu, Muslim, and all the other religions. United, we survive. Divided, we die of thirst. <laughs> and in Gujarat, we have a long tradition of living with the other, even when we don't like their politics. One of my mother's uncles was a famous lawyer in Baruch. He was a communist and a member of the Gujarat legislature in the 1950s. I grew up going to Baruch, and some of my happiest memories are of sitting on the roof of the house at the end of a hot summer evening as my fua drank beer with the local bootlegger, who was his client, and the local police inspector, who the bootlegger was bribing. <laughs> Sometimes I would go for a walk with his son, my cousin Raju, who was also a lawyer. Raju's best friend was a Muslim man named Sheikh. Every evening, they would go for a walk by the river and then to the Baruj railway station, arguing ferociously over politics. Then they would share a cup of chai. My cousin is a staunch Bhakt, and his best friend is a staunch Muslim. Sheikh, you are a communalist, my cousin lambasted him. As the bootlegger shared a beer with the cop, the Hindu Twadi and the Qatar Musliman shared a cup of chai, after all, they're both Gujarati. Why get a whole cup to yourself? <laughs> One by two, they say. One by two, the bootlegger says to the cop. <laughs> One by two, the Hindu communalist says to the Muslim communalist. I find it an endearing formula. You know the joke, five Gujaratis come into a two shop and ask for two by five, two cups of chai split into five. And while you're at it, they instruct the boy, put the fan on and dust off the scooter outside. One by two, two by five, three by eight. We good Jews are used to sharing, economizing. We might not be inclined to spend, but we know how to share. But these new good Jews don't believe in one by two anymore. It's all one by one, one for one, one and only one. We are one people, many splendid. The British divided us, made us two, one by two. Let us not believe in this rubbish. Western logic rests on a fundamental binary. The Aristotelian law of the excluded middle. Something is true or false. You believe in my God or you are an unbeliever. There is no gray area. You're with us or against us, as George Bush declared. Indian philosophy is very different. The Jain system of logic has no fewer than seven possible states of being. Something can be true, false, both, neither. It's the most exquisitely developed system of conditional logic the world has ever known. And you know what it's called? Shyadwada, the science of maybeness. The BJP is now saying, you are either Hindu or you're not. And if you're not, you can't be Indian. Let's get back to Shyadwada. Let's admit doubt. Let's not be so damned sure about everything, who is an Indian and who's not. There's always been a tradition of openness, hospitality, coexistence in Gujarat, no less than in any other part of this marvelous land. This was the Gujarat, after all, that welcomed all kinds of outsiders including the Zoroastrians fleeing from Iran. When they landed near Udwada, the ruler, Jadi Rana, came out to greet them, but said that Gujarat was already full and pointed to a pot of milk 
filled to the brim. The newcomers stirred a teaspoon of sugar into the milk and presented it to Jadi Rana. We will live here like this. We will sweeten your life without displacing you. And the Parsis took up the Gujarati language and their women wore saris. Later, the Boras, Khojas, Maimans did the same. They eat, pray, and love in the same language that I do. The great filmmaker Ismail Merchant was Gujarati, and I spoke to him in Gujarati. The great historian Mahmoud Mamdani is Gujarati, and when we meet in New York, we crack off-color jokes in Gujarati with an East African accent. The great writer Adil Mansouri was a family friend who encouraged me early in my writing career. The Palanpuri diamond merchants I grew up amongst were not big fans of Muslims. Many of them financed the Jansang and are now financing the BJP. Yet the older Palanpuris could recite ghazals in Urdu. The Nawab of Palanpur had excellent relations with his Hindu and Jain subjects, who he appointed as his ministers. We are next door to Pakistan, but for 70 years the door has been firmly shut. But if we put our ears close to the door, we can hear the same bhasha. Now we have Gujarati speaking in bad Hindi, telling 200 million people of this land that they need to prove that they're Indian. They're demanding papers to prove their citizenship. In Maximum City, I wrote that government bureaucracy had made India the country of the no. I wrote this talk partly on board an Air India flight from New York. Nothing worked. The TV controls were broken, many of the seats were broken, the headphones were broken, the blankets and eye masks had all been stolen, and when I asked for something, the answer was no. <laughs> to trust such a government machinery to perform such a mammoth task as to assign birth certificates and citizenship papers fairly is to expect the impossible. As a result, millions of Indian citizens are going to be classified as illegal and put in camps. The CAA and the NRC will tear apart this land, this beautiful idea of India, which is that it does not belong to any one community, not Hindu, not Muslim, not anybody else. It belongs to all of us. This is supposed to be a country where the mind is free from fear. The mind is not free from fear these days, very far from it. The mind is full of fear. Gujaratis are global citizens par excellence. We approach the world with confidence. One out of every three overseas Indians is Gujarati. My own family has been in and out of Gujarat for over a century now and is spread all over the earth in Kenya, Dubai, America, England, Australia. We Gujaratis are wanderers everywhere. You know, when Neil Armstrong stepped off Apollo 11 and took his first step on the moon, he was greeted by a Gujarati chaiwala who said, Neil bhai, ao, ao, what took you so long? We do not lose anything by wandering. We respect the countries we wander to, and we contribute to them. But Gujaratis also know what it feels like to be hated, hunted. During the 1960 riots in Bombay, when the state was being broken in two, and Gujarat and Maharashtra were both claiming the city, Maharashtrian mobs ran after Gujaratis in the streets with sticks shouting, Su che, saru che, danda leke maru che. Yes, we too were called termites once, illegal immigrants told to go back to where we came from. What explains this anger, this insecurity, this hatred? How could Gandhiji and Amit Shah come from the same land? Gujaratis are, by legend, supposed to be frugal, thrifty. Nehru referred to us in Discovery of India as, quote, a small-boned mercantile people. Would that he could see our 56-inch chests. Throughout my childhood, I was mocked because I was Gujarati and therefore thought to be weaker than, for example, Punjabis or Kashmiris. Another joke goes, do you know why there isn't a Gujarati regiment in the Indian Army and first Gujarat rifles? There used to be one, but they were all shot for trading with the enemy. In recent times, there's been a curious sexual insecurity, a crisis of masculinity among Gujarati men. The whole love jihad thing. What is it but a fear of Muslim men being more sexually attractive to our gullible women? And then along came Modi with his 56 inch chest and all over Gujarat and in New Jersey and in Wembley, Gujarati hearts started fluttering at the Gujarati Elvis. Here was Krishna and here were his gopis rescued from the lascivious Topiwala. Modi, with his bombast, his aggression, reclaimed an idea of Gujarati virility. The RSS, the organization he came from and now controls him, is an entirely male body. That tells you everything you need to know about their ethos and their insecurities. 
Gandhiji had another idea of masculinity, which was closer to a form of androgyny. But today's Gujaratis have had enough of Gandhi, enough of nonviolence, of satyagraha. They believe only in graha, war, not satya, truth. Dekho, dekho, kaun aya, Gujarat ka sher aya, they say in Gujarat at Modi's rallies, a lion, not a pussy. It is a family fight among Gujaratis. Most of my relatives vote for the BJP, as they did for the Jansang before that. But many children of Gujarati immigrants in the US and the UK want nothing to do with this politics of hate. They identify as South Asian or Desi rather than Indian. They don't understand how their parents could oppose Donald Trump. And 87% of Indian Americans voted Democratic for Hillary in the 2016 election and also support Modi. They don't understand how we can demand tolerance for Indian Americans abroad while being intolerant to Bangladeshi immigrants at home. We need to respect the whole world, like Narsi says. We need to let good thoughts come to us from all sides, like the Rig Veda says. When my uncle, Vasan Kaka, came to visit us in New York soon after we immigrated, he gave me a bit of advice which I'll always follow. Take the best from the East and the best from the West. He was not privileging one over the other. The Vedas don't have a corner on truth, and neither does the Quran or the Bible, but each has some of it. I am an overseas citizen of India. I was born in India. There's a little notice clause in the CAA under which the government can stop me from entering India for any violation of any notified law, like a parking ticket. They might go after writers like me for saying things they don't like. Let them try. They can never stop me from entering India unless they rip out my heart, because India is not an external entity for me. It is who I am. I carry my India within me. There's a line in a poem by Ardeshir Khabardar. Jaya vasse ek Gujarati, tiantia sada kal Gujarat. Where there is a Gujarati, there's always a Gujarat. We can wander the earth without losing ourselves, without wondering who we are, because we carry our Gujarat with us, like our thepla chundo. I have eaten my thepla chundo in the favelas of Brazil, in the palaces of Europe, in the ryokans of Japan. I appreciate all cultures, but I do not lose myself to any of them. They add to who I am. They never take away from me. We are good Jews. We are global good Jews. Every Gujarati home I have gone to has been welcoming with a glass of water first brought to you, then gantia, farsan, and an invitation. Come eat with us. When you part from a Gujarati, he will not say goodbye. He will say, aujo, come again. That is the true spirit of Gujarat. We do not erect doors, fences, walls, detention camps. Our home is open to all. Aujo, gare aujo, come home, chokhas aujo. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think we have a lot to discuss. I was struck by, well, many things, but one of, one of the phrases you, you used was the politics of mass diversion. And if we look around the world, what's happening here in India is not unique, right? It's happening in the, United, in the US, in the UK, in Turkey, in various parts of the world. And all of them share this common theme of mass diversion and scapegoating. What do you think is behind that? Why now? So the 2008 financial crisis in the West robbed many, many people of their futures. These were people, they were working class people in factory towns in Michigan and Pennsylvania. There were also people in, you know, working class people all across Europe. And suddenly their money was gone. Um, who took it? Um, well, it was the elites. I mean, income inequality has been rising in the West like never before. Um, and all over the world, income inequality is rising. Today, six people, all men, own more than half of the planet, or 3.5 billion people combined. So the, there's a lot of angry people, because you know, they expected in a, that their children's lives would be better than theirs. And that's not happening. Um, so who to blame? Well, the elites that took away their money were no fools. They knew that the peasants would come for them with pitchforks if their anger wasn't diverted. So who better to divert it 
onto than the newest or the weakest, the immigrants. So in America, you know, Trump got elected by railing against the Wall Street elites. As soon as he came into office, he passed the biggest corporate tax cut in history. And these same elites now um, love him. Um, but what he's done successfully is to take the anger of the working class away from the rich elites and project it onto immigrants, Mexicans, you know, Latinos, um, Muslims. And it's the same thing in Europe. I mean, Brexit, which is the biggest own goal in British history, it, you know, it might destroy the United Kingdom, was built on a fear of migrants. Um, uh, you, you look at Germany, you look at Italy, the same thing. I didn't expect it would happen in India the way it has. Like, after I wrote my book, this whole thing about the citizenship and determining who's Indian and who's not, that really, uh, for the last six months, has been this inferno in India. It was the same sort of thing. As the economy goes down, the level of hate and vitriol goes up. And w where are the parties around the world that normally would be the ones representing that anger, the Democratic Party, the Labour Party in the UK, maybe Congress here, why have they failed so spectacularly? So I think in the end, it is um, a question of storytelling, of narrative. If you look at all these populists around the world, whether it's Modi here or Trump in America or Bolsonaro in Brazil or Duterte or Putin or Orban or you know, Boris Johnson, on and on, these, these populists, they are gifted storytellers. This is the one thing they have in common. They can tell a false story well. And the only way they can be fought is by telling a true story better. And too often the left, you know, we speak in academic terms or we look down on people who are not like us. We don't go out into this place. Hillary never went out into Wisconsin and um, Michigan. She took these states for granted. So, you know, we need to go out to people who don't agree with us. Like in India, we, you know, I spend a lot of time speaking to people who don't agree with me and kind of, and let them know why the story that they're being fed, that these outsiders are responsible for their problems, is not true. We need to become better storytellers. And that's why the other thing that these populists have in common is that going after journalists and writers, storytellers all over the world, they go after us because they know we present the biggest threat, because we can fight them in the worldwide battle of storytelling. Another phrase that you mentioned that struck with me is the emasculation uh, that was implicit in, in these politics. And it's, it's interesting because if you look at fascist movements throughout history, uh, you can look at many of them as ways in which uh, they're putting forth a politi like a very sexualized politics, right? Where they're claiming to have been emasculated. For example, the, German, the Nazis were emasculated by the Treaty of Versailles in World War I, right? And the Great Depression. Uh, similar sentiments in Italy. Do you see a common th thread there um, between that? You're absolutely right. Um, you know, there is a, the fascists have, have created uh, this idea uh, and you see, you see this all over the world. In Europe, too, there are these images of these menacing um, brown-skinned men uh, coming for their women. You know, these narratives of rape. And they did the same thing in the American South um, after slavery. There were all these lynchings of black men for allegedly raping white women. Um, and at the core of it is a feeling that um, their masculinity the pride in being a man has been taken away from them. And an economic crisis can do this to you. I saw this in my Bombay book when I hung out with these young carders of the Shiv Sena. They felt that in a time where they couldn't get jobs, their ability to provide for their family was threatened. They couldn't you know, bring home money. And so they got filled with this anger and the only way they saw to reclaim their masculinity was this incredible aggression. So the same thing with Gujaratis. I mean, you, uh, 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 I grew up with these stereotypes of Gujaratis. As you know, Nehru himself said, we're a small boned mercantile people. We don't go to war. We're more interested in trading than war. Um, and you know, there's been this steady, slow buildup of anger. Um, some of the worst riots in post-independence India were in 1969 in Ahmedabad, uh, and that still continues. So, 
now, you know, this language that I hear is really a kind of insecure, threatened male identity. Again, it's not the Gujarat of Narsi Mehta, it's not the Gujarat of Gandhiji. Um, and we need to reclaim the Gujarat of the mother goddess, of, of Shakti. In Maximum City, you described in extraordinary detail uh, the worldview from within the Shiv Sena. And I'm really interested in hearing your remarks today, how you would compare that experience and the, the Shiv Sena as a movement to what's emerged out of Gujarat. Well, I mean, they're not exactly comparable because um, the Shiv Sena was sort of local populist movement. It wanted to drive out outsiders from Maharashtra and from Bombay. They started first with the communists and then went on to the South Indians and then they went on to the Gujaratis, then they went to the Muslims and now they're on to the North Indians. And now, <laughs> you know, the Shiv Sena is actually against the BJP and uh, Indian politics is endlessly fascinating and you never know. And that might actually save the country, um, uh, these unlikely alliances. Um, but, you know, the, the same sort of young men on the streets, so I hung out with a lot of these young Shiv Sena men who had burnt alive Muslims during the riots. Um, and in Gujarat too, one of my best friends growing up in Ahmedabad was a kind of street thug. And he would always be in the forefront of every riot. He would go out, he has marks across his face from being slashed by swords, he's been beaten up, he's beaten other people, I'm sure he's killed people in the riots. And you know, these are, he, and he's from the old city of Ahmedabad, the Poles. Um, but there's constantly some sort of tension uh, simmering. So these political parties, they thrive on this anger of young men. And during times of economic crisis, like the one we're experiencing right now, um, a spark can become an inferno. So while the BJP is, you know, it's all over India, you know, what's most alarming now is the spread of this Hindutva ideology to the south, there are people in the south, particularly the middle classes, who are buying into uh, this, uh, 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 this Hindutva ideology. Don't they realize that these are people who, they might go after Muslims now, and you know, uh, there are people who like that. Next, they'll go after the South Indians and demand that everyone speaks Hindi. They're already doing that. You know, we have to stand up for the first minority that gets attacked. A democracy is one in which it protects the rights of the minority. When you protect the rights of a minority, you also protect, as a happy side effect, the rights of the majority. And when you don't protect the rights of minority, every other minority's rights are threatened. Each one of us is a minority in some sense. We might be you know, gay or a woman or you know, non-Hindi speaking or of a different caste. Each of us is a minority. We need to stand up for the first minority that gets attacked. I want to ask about your latest book, uh, This Land is Our Land. Can you describe why you decided to write it? And this is a book written to Americans, really, right? Specifically. So um, I've been writing a book about New York for an embarrassingly long time, about 10 years now. Um, but it took me seven years to write Maximum City. Yeah. Um, but after Trump got elected in 2016, the whole worldwide conversation about immigrants really started enraging me. This idea of immigrants as takers, as robbers, as parasites. And um, I decided to put aside my New York book and write something about it. Because the whole conversation about immigrants in the West is, you know, they're coming here to take from us. So my book begins with a story that my grandfather, who was born in rural Gujarat and then left to work in uh, Kenya and then retired in London where his son was living. Uh, my grandfather told me this story. He was sitting in a park in North London one day in the 1990s. And this elderly British gent comes up to him and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to your country? And my grandfather, who was a Gujarati businessman said, because we are the creditors. You came to my country, you took my gold and my diamonds, so we have come to collect. <laughs> that we are here because you were there. And that seems to me, you know, the reason for much of global migration. Um, 
the West now says you need visas to come into our countries, you are, you know, uh, illegal migrants, uh, you should respect our laws, you shouldn't be illegal. Ask yourself this, has the West ever respected anyone else's borders? So through colonialism, corporate colonialism, war, and climate change, the rich countries have stolen the future of the poor countries. This is the case I make in my book, and I back it up with stories and extensively researched statistics. You know, we human beings have always migrated throughout our history as a species. We have a God-given right to move. Um, and migration is, you know, it's just a fact of life. As climate change really kicks in, you ain't seen nothing yet. The United Nations forecasts that over a billion people will be forced to move from their homes by climate change by the middle of the century. Where do you think they're going to go? People are concerned now about four million Syrians going to Germany uh, because of the war. What happens when Bangladesh gets flooded and 40 million Bangladeshis have to find dry land? So we need to, as a, you know, as a species, we need to have a coordinated responses to the migration that is to come. And we also need to assign blame where blame is due. Um, take climate change. I mean, you know how hot it was in India last year and how many people roasted to death. Who's responsible for it? The United States put one third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere and the EU another quarter. So when people move from Bangladesh or Mauritius or wherever it is, the people that have, the countries that have caused the most to uh, cause this whole mess, they should have a proportionate share of the migrants that are moving. So I'm calling for immigration as reparations. The title comes from a Woody Guthrie song. And it's, uh, it was interesting for me because growing up in America, we used to sing this song every, every day in class when I was a child. But we never sang the full song, just certain verses of it. And you, just, you discuss this in the book if you want to talk about that. Yeah, there was a whole stanza which uh, Pete Seeger once sang, and you know people don't generally know. Um, I don't have my book. I don't remember the exact lines, but basically the other lines that were kept out of the Woody Guthrie song were about coming across a big high wall on a sign that said "No trespassing," and you know a line for people waiting for food. And then um, his, he claims in this wonderful song uh, his right to wander all over the world, to, to go over walls, to go past no trespassing signs. The fact that this land is our land, it was built for you and me. And this applies equally to the Mexican migrant uh, at the American border as the Bangladeshi migrant at the Indian border. This land is our land, this world was our world, it was built for you and me. Ask one last question, then maybe you can open it up for questions of the audience. I'm going to ask the hardest question last, which is, and you hinted at it at various times, what we need to do. Um, but in a grand sense, because these are global systemic problems, what can we do? So, you know, I'm not calling for open borders. I don't know how politically feasible that is right now. I am calling for open hearts. Look at these people as human beings who are moving. And I'll tell you a story about maybe some of the most emotional reporting I've ever done. Uh, and it was on the US-Mexico border. Um, right below San Diego, um, and on the border of the Mexican city of Tijuana. There is a wall, but right where the wall ends, right by the Pacific Ocean, there's a park called Friendship Park, which was built during the Nixon administration. So it's the only place along the entire 3,000-mile border where you can go and meet people who are on the other side of the border face to face. It's a bit like the Vaga border. Sometimes they open it up. I've also talked about the Vaga border in my book where you can actually you know, um, see Pakistanis uh, face to face or across a fence. So, uh, so I spent two weeks in Friendship Park and there's a fence. You can't actually go up it used to be that you could go and have a picnic. Let's say you didn't have papers, you were on the American side. You could sit down with your family on the other side and you could you know, eat with them, give them a hug, and then they would go back to Mexico, you'd come back to America. That all changed. So now there's a thick iron fence. And this place is open uh, on the weekends where 
uh, if you're a migrant, you can go and for 10 minutes, you can say hello to your family. So I saw a Mexican man who hadn't seen his mother in 17 years. And he had come to America so that he could send back money for his mother's medical treatment. These migrants are not rapists or terrorists, they're ordinary heroes. Almost all of them migrate so they can send money back to their families. So here was this man, he goes up to the fence and his mom comes up to the fence. And their faces are so close, he can feel her breath on his face. He hasn't seen her for 17 years. He says, Mama, I miss you. She says, Son, I love you. And he can't give her a hug. So he puts up his hand to the fence. And the holes in the fence are only big enough to put his pinky finger through. And his mom puts her pinky finger through, and they touch like this. It's called the pinky kiss. That's all that he can do before the guards tell him to come back from the fence. So all along the fence, there were these migrants and this kissing of the pinky. F you know, if you've ever had a, an issue with someone in your family, a break with someone, go to Friendship Park and see what happens when the state and lawyers separate your family from you and see the hunger of these people to reunite with their families. They're not terrorists, they're not termites, they're ordinary heroes. Take a few questions. Okay. We'll take some questions. You in the green. Hello. Am I audible? Okay. Um, sir, I have a question. I have two questions, in fact, and they are interrelated. So um, I'm from Ahmedabad, been there for 30 years. And there's this very interesting dichotomy that one sees in Gujarat these days. On one hand, the community, as you rightly pointed out, is completely business-oriented, business-driven. It is dhando that matters more than anything else. But at the same time, despite all the uh, you know, economic turmoil that uh, seems to be affecting everybody else, doesn't seem to be affecting the average Gujarati. So when you go to the average Gujarati and tell him, like you said, onions are 328% more than what they used to be, hi, Ebadu Chalse, pan avse to Modij. So this, I mean, <laughs> it's difficult to understand for a common person without a political science or sociology background, what is causing this uh, blind uh, loyalty? Uh, so this is one part of my question. The second, you mentioned about the politics of mass diversion. And mass diversion can only happen if you create an elaborate ecosystem of propaganda to distract people, which, as we have seen, has already happened. So sometimes it makes you wonder, as a common citizen, why not just do your work, which is to you know, work on the economy and keep the common man uh, involved, productively engaged, rather than create this entire elaborate system of propaganda to keep them diverted and again create new diversions from time to time. What is the idea behind having this model of politics when you've come to power with a complete majority? That's difficult to understand. Um, so, um, you know, we are middle class or upper middle class or even rich. I think if you actually go outside the business community, and it's not true that all Gujaratis are business people, even the majority of Gujaratis are not business people, you know, they have, um, they are suffering. They do feel it when onions rise to 28% price rises, uh, like all the rest uh, of uh, the country. I saw this firsthand um, in, uh, you know, the alleged Gujarat miracle uh, when Modi was Chief Minister of Gujarat. I covered the elections. And again, it was a question of narrative. People thought that there was this Gujarat medical, it was the richest state. No, there were seven other Indian states which actually had a higher growth rate than Gujarat. But it's the narrative that he was able to spin. He's a master storyteller, I'll give him that. He can make himself appear in a hologram across the entire country. You know, um, None of the opposition have this, these skills of narrative. But we Gujaratis also know, you know, uh, when we are being cheated, we are also um, uh, quite canny that way. Um, so, it, when you talk about this, this 
the mass diversion and what we can do. Yes, absolutely, they have an absolute majority. Um, they should fix their attention on improving the economy, but it's also true that some part of their base, and this is not just in Gujarat, it's all over the country, really has come to think that this is a country for Hindus only, and anyone else who lives here lives so at our sufferance. Now, I am a Hindu, and very proud of it. Um, but my Hinduism, the reason I call myself a Hindu, is because it's a religion that admits all other religions. It disrespects none of the other religions. This is my Hinduism, and I believe this is the true Hinduism. Right? So this is what we need to, to get back to. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I'm Prakash Vandari, I'm a journalist. Uh, there are Gujaratis, they claim that they are wealth creator. And Tata's, Godrej, the Coopers, they are also Gujaratis. But Tata's in Godrej enjoyed credibility and respect, while Ammanis and Adanis do not. Why is this? They are also wealth creator. They are also contributed to the economy. They have given jobs. But the Parsi wealth creators somehow always enjoy an edge as far as credibility and respect. Uh, well, you know, I haven't really heard Ratan Tata criticize the government. Uh, um, I haven't really heard the Birlas uh, take issue with, um, the, with the CAA or the NRC or even the, the terrible way that the economy is doing, right? It's, so I don't want to assign blame to any one particular industrialist. Most of them have been quiet. Um, uh, Adani is particularly um, reprehensible um, because of this coal mine that he's going to open in Australia. And this coal is going to be burnt here in India. I mean, look at the pollution in Jaipur, in Delhi. We are living in gas chambers. Do we really want to burn even more coal? I mean, so that we can sell it to neighboring countries and, uh, and make some money. We are dying here. So, you know, th these people have a responsibility to speak up. And Gandhiji knew it. You know, he, he had this trusteeship theory. And when, he had these, uh, when there was a textile strike against uh, these industrialists, the families of some of these industrialists came over and fasted with Gandhiji against their own relatives because they believed that if you are rich, it's not enough just to be enriched. You are holding the, uh, the wealth of the people in trust. Um, now, you know, Marxists may disagree with this theory, um, but there was at least this, this idea um, among earlier industrialists, you know, uh, including the Bedlars and many Gujarati industrialists, um, the Sarabhai, for instance, that they, they were part of a national struggle, that it wasn't just about making their own uh, mansions. Uh, it wasn't just about, you know, owning a cricket league or having fancy cars. It was the progress of a nation. They really believed in this. And I, I don't know many of the current crop of industrialists who believe this. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about giving this talk in Gujarati, uh, in Gujarat to Gujaratis, and what you imagine the reactions from your fellow Gujaratis might be like in the state itself? I very much would like to give this talk in Gujarati. Um, you know, I, uh, I'll go there and I'll speak. I know that I might be very unpopular. My own relatives um, are very pro-BJP, even in America, especially in America. I think, you know, what I'm going to do is give this talk among Gujaratis in America, because that's where the money comes from. Um, uh, that might actually be more, more effective there. Um, you know, and it's, and, and this thing about Gujaratis overseas who funding the BJP, and when Modi came to uh, Madison Square Garden, there were 50,000 Indians, most of them Gujaratis. The same thing with this Howdy Modi summit in Houston. Uh, because there's been a kind of narrative of 
Gujarat that is projected there, and there aren't enough Gujaratis speaking up against him. This is why I wrote this, this talk now. And absolutely, um, I would love to have this talk translated in Gujarati, have it published there, and to go to, to Gujarat and, you know, take on people who disagree with me, because I have all these disagreements constantly uh, with my own family, some of my closest family members. Would you say the majority of the Gujarati American population is behind Modi? Or just does it? Uh, the majority of the overseas Gujarati population at this point, yes, is pro Modi. You know, there's a kind of, again, it's that, that insecurity that I talked about before, this wounded pride that, you know, we were ruled by the Muslims, we were ruled by the British, and now finally we can be proud that we are, you know, ruling ourselves. We won't be beaten up anymore. We have. Um, uh, and it, you know, it, it doesn't come from confidence. Like the Gujaratis that I know, the, the reason that we went all around the world and we did so well around the world is because we approached the world with confidence, not fear, not insecurity. Have you? Yes. Thank you for the uh, very uh, um, wonderful talk that you've given. Uh, what I heard uh, you mention at one time was that uh, the economic crisis is causing uh, a feeling of emasculation in uh, males, right? And then you say that because of this, there are sexual assaults and many misdeeds. Uh, are you justifying that? Isn't there some other resolution to this uh, emasculation that the males feel? No, that's not what I said at all. You m misheard me. Um, I, I, I said that this, this emasculation, it results from a crisis of the economy. It doesn't mean that they go out and rape women. What I'm saying is that um, the love jihad thing, this idea of lynching Muslims because of these imagined seductions of Hindu women, that is an outgrowth of the, um, uh, of the emasculation. The rapes and you know, the horrific sexual assaults that we've been witnessing, I mean, that is across the board, and it's a crisis of Indian masculinity overall. It's a lack of deep uh, disrespect for women, which we have in our culture and which needs to be rooted out. But we're not brave enough at addressing it. Instead, we, ca we call for idiotic solutions like public hangings and lynchings of these rapists. No, it's much deeper than that. It's in all of us. It's in every single Indian male, including myself. It's what we were taught, uh, the idea of women uh, as inferior, uh, as sexual playthings that we were brought up with. That needs to be, it needs to be a wholesale um, re-education of every single Indian male. Uh, hi, as a, as, a, as, a, as a question, as a, as a Gujarati settled in San Francisco, um, I, I am, you know, I'm a venture capitalist, I've been investing in US, but I'm now starting to invest in India. As I open the hood here, I get a distinct feeling that a um, lot of people here don't want us opening the lid mm. on India. They don't want us looking in from outside mm. because they know we can make a difference. I would also like to push it further and say, I sometimes feel that a lot of people are quite happy that India is uh, poor and can, most of in, lot of India is poor and ignorant. First thing I discovered is that there is no Ministry of Education. In a country of 1.3 billion people, we don't have a budget for education. We, it's, it comes under human resource development or something like that. We have no ministry. So the second thing I ran into... <coughs> you have a question, sir? Is it, uh, so, no, so I'm, do you sometimes feel that there might be you know, systems or structures in place in India where people are perfectly happy if it was an oppressed nation, you know? Well, I mean, uh, there are uh, powerful caste groups who are deeply invested in this politics of oppression.
famines is because of a free press, because news of famines in distant regions could reach the center, and the center had to do something, otherwise they'd get voted uh, out of office. So it's the same thing with business. I know a number of people who were considering investing in India, and now they're reading all these reports, and they're saying, wait, hold on a second. You know, we thought this was going to be better than China. We thought that this would be a government who couldn't just, who wasn't tyrannical, it was a democracy. Um, uh, we need to give this a second thought. So it, it goes hand in hand. Um, as George Soros points out, an open society is good for business. That's all we have time for, so join me in thanking Suketu Mehta. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to our speakers for that enriching session and our sponsors, Dainik Bhaskar. Do note that the authors will be signing their book at the book signing desk located right at the entrance of Charbagh. The festival brochure and flyer with the full program are available for purchase at the JCB Price for Literature bookshop managed by Full Circle. The next session at Charbagh is session 178, Biographer's Ball, which will be starting shortly. Thank you.